Thank you very much. Yes, just fucking do it. Um, <laughs> I know, I can't believe they let me away with that one. Um, I mean, I hope there are no Nike employees in the room because I might be done for, I don't know, slander, copyright, whatever it is. Uh, I'm... I'm Sarah Janjua and I live by just fucking do it because um, I'm all for positive affirmations and I think it's really important what we tell ourselves when we're going into situations. Um, and this might not necessarily seem like the most positive, but I am here to tell you that yes, it really, really is. Uh, first of all, I want to ask everyone, would you take the voice in your head to dinner? I don't know if you've ever been asked this before, even if you know what I mean by it, but it's really important to think about this for a second. Um, I would take my mum to dinner. I would take people who love me to dinner. I would take my best friends, the people closest to me, people that fill me with hope and tell me really positive things about myself. But sometimes I wouldn't take the voice in my head to dinner. And it's something that I realised when I was becoming a presenter. I hadn't a bloody clue what I was doing. I went from being a print journalist and uh, the first day that I was asked, I always just turned up to the office looking like I could be chucked on camera and one day they said listen the presenter's phone in sick why don't you can we get you in the chair and I went yeah, yeah absolutely you know ran to the toilet and I was sick and I called my mum and I was like what the f am I doing I have no idea what I'm doing in my life and it started to make me realize that you know the, the that voice that you have in your head and the important part that that plays in what you do and how you do it it, it ultimately determines everything that you end up doing and there's a few things in particular that, you know, I've discovered along the way. There was a there was a study that IKEA commissioned in 2019 in the United Arab Emirates, and they took two sets of plants and two groups of school children for a number of weeks. The only thing, the only conditions that were any different when these school children went in to see each set of plants was that one of them, they were really lovely to, they spoke to, I don't know if anyone speaks to plants, but apparently it's a thing and apparently it's a good thing to do. I kill everything, so, you know. Um, but the only thing that was different was one set of plants got po positive affirmations and the second set were screamed at, shouted at, told they were useless. I mean, listen, it's a great bit of marketing for IKEA. I get that, you know, it really, it comes down to a bit of a PR spin for them. But what it tells you is, you know, after the few weeks, the ones that did not have the positive affirmations, the ones that were yelled at, screamed at, told they were useless, rubbish, were never going to amount to anything, were visibly wilting. Okay, and take from that what you will. Um, I tell myself, just fucking do it. Because I think for three reasons, I think that sometimes um, we can really procrastinate and hold ourselves back and think about some of the things that we need to do before we get to our end goals before just fucking going for it and doing what we want to do but I also think it 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 really affects the way we interact with people. I think that when you don't just fucking do it, then it really affects how we communicate. It affects who we communicate with. But also, you know, it comes down to, so it's affecting your goals. It's affecting the way you communicate with people. And, you know, it's affecting your ability to communicate to the world what you do, which is one of the most important things, I think. So, um, my career is as a multi-hyphen and the way it came about, I can't even really tell you. It's a squiggly career path. I basically studied business management as an undergraduate degree, hadn't a clue what I was doing and graduated, was fired from a succession of jobs. I think I've been sacked 21 times in total. Yeah, sacked 21 times. And usually when I tell people this, they say, God, why? What did you do? What was so bad? Um, there were a range of things that happened. Uh, there was a lot of bar jobs and, and things I wasn't really taking too seriously. So, you know, maybe I shouldn't count those. Um, on the plus side, I am writing a book about it. So, you know, turning it into something positive, which is great. But uh, yeah, I mean, if you want to know a few incidents, I think one in particular that I'm really happy to share because I still am really happy that I did it was to throw a pint over a boss. Oh, yeah. yeah, honestly, if you've never done it, well, first of all, <laughs> I don't condone violence, but I, I do endorse gumption. And it was absolutely something that, that, was, that was necessary to do at the time. And um, it, it felt wonderful. So, uh, but needless to say, I, I was working in a bar at that time, which might help to explain why I had a pint in my hand at that point. Um, but I did go back for my tips the next day. So um, no more, no more, uh, no more work for me there. But yeah, I got my money. Um, 
being a multi-hyphen and the reason I, I've developed this career is that I didn't have a clue what I was doing. And when I graduated from university, I ended up working in a rum bar in Bermuda and traveling for a while. My dad's Pakistani. I was brought up as a Muslim. And so you can imagine how delighted he was after spending <laughs> six years in university and I'm away working in a bar in Bermuda. Yeah, he was so happy. Um, so happy. Um, yeah, I, I, I had no direction and I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I, I decided just to enjoy myself and enjoy, enjoy the world, which is what I did for a long time before going back to university and studying a master's degree, which led to journalism. And journalism really, for me, was a point where I realised the opportunities that exist, not just in writing, but with on television. And my career really went from writing in print to working as a TV presenter across news, broad, broadcast news, um, daytime entertainment, animal shows. I gave a rhino a bath. I mean, that was a highlight, I think. <laughs> um, but one of the other things that, that happened while I was working in television was I was offered the opportunity to do stand-up comedy for the first time. And it made me feel like my heart was going to drop through my backside. And so I thought, I need to run towards this. I, I hate feeling scared. I hate it. It, it worries me because I think it's, it, sh it shows me what my limitations are. And I thought, do you know what? I'm going to give this a bash. I was working on a late show at the time and a comedian had come in and he was really nervous. So I, told, I was telling him a story about something that happened to me that day. He said, this is great. You should do it. You should do it in a 10 minute set at my friend's show. And I was like, no, I can't do that. And he said, yeah, yeah, you should come and do it. When my boss found out, he said, this is great. We'll send cameras. We'll film it. <laughs> I was like, what the? This is not, this was like more of a self-development kind of thing, Paul. This wasn't like a, but it ended up doing really well. And um, I did really well from it. I, I was a Scottish Comedian of the Year a few years ago and have since uh, gone on to develop a writing career. I write comedy, uh, sitcoms now for the BBC and for CBBC. I have my own sitcom currently in development, which is you know great to, to be able to, to, to do. But the way it came about was by taking opportunities when they, when they came along. Now, if you don't know what multi-hyphenism is, God, it sounds a wee bit wank, doesn't it? I have to apologise <laughs> because it is. But it was, it was a term that was coined by uh, journalist Emma Gannon. She is a business journalist and she was trying to define what it is that she does. And I found it so hard to pigeonhole, right? What is it that I do now? Because, you know, I direct, I do filmmaking, I do all sorts of things now in life. So how do I actually define what it is that I do? Um, so she has this term multi-hyphen. For the first time, I was like, oh my God, I can pigeonhole what I, what I do now. This is fantastic. And it comes from the idea that really in 40 years time, most of us are going to be working from a portfolio career. So most of us will be doing more than just one thing. And we're not really supposed to be doing just one thing in life. Uh, it's these all the jobs we do are, you know, self-made, man-made, women-made, women-made constructs. So, you know, why is it that we choose just to do one thing and why do we have to do thing one thing really, really well? And, you know, I always throughout my career, I felt like, you know, the, the expression square peg round hole? I felt like a rhombocosidodicahedron. Oh my God, I said it the first time. <laughs> Practicing that so much. A very complex geometric shape trying to fit into something that was just not right for me. And I was putting up a lot of barriers in my, my place thinking, you know, how do I, <clears throat> how, how do I change my life? Like, how do you change your life when it's, when it's shit, when you feel that your boss isn't listening to you? By the time I, I actually got round to leaving my job, I had spent so much time uh, doing fr work for free or taking holidays to then do charity work that I had no more holidays left. Um, I was spending all my spare time running my passion projects and the things that I really wanted to do. Uh, my dad was delighted when I told him, you know, he's Pakistani. He's like, mashallah, this is good. Using holiday to do more work. This is very good. <laughs> you know, like, it's not really the point, Dad. The point is I feel very restricted in the shape that I'm in at the moment. So I need to change things up. I need to switch things around. And so, yeah, when we, when we, when we don't just fucking do things, sometimes it can really create a lot of problems for us. But, you know, I want you to start thinking about some of the goals you have and why, why have you not achieved them? And it might be that you are actually really busy. It might be that you've got lots going on in life. It might be you've got a busy job and kids and you've had to buy a new home recently and there's been lots of stresses. But actually, why have you not done what you want to do? And the answer for a lot of people is that we kind of procrastinate or we put, you know, reasons in place. And women especially have been uh, shown to take a bit longer to get around to chasing their goals because we feel like we need to upskill. We feel like before we apply for the 
job that we really want, we should probably go all around the houses over here and then finally get to applying for it. Whereas a lot of men will feel, yeah, okay, I, I, that's what I want to do. So I'll just shoot for the jugular and go for it. <laughs> And I think that we can learn a lot from that. It's it, the reason I wasn't <laughs> for years, for years and years and years, even while I was at university studying, I had an ideas book full of just silly, just silly ideas, silly characters, silly, you know, this could be a, a, a comedy sketch or this could be a story. I loved writing. I loved story. I love people. And I had the, this book that then became two books that then became three and just I had them sitting there and I was doing nothing with them and if there's one thing that I've learned it's turn your ideas into something tangible because when you have nothing to show for your ideas it's really hard to sell anything to anyone it's really hard to convince anyone to take you on when you haven't turned it into something that they can recognize or something that they can see. I moved to London uh, four years ago when I had been dumped and made redundant in the same week. I was hoping for an all, but that's okay. <laughs> Lacking a bit of empathy in the room today. That's fine. <laughs> so I, I, I was really not in a, in a good place at all um, when, I, when I moved down here. And I, I was just, you know, I, I thought, what the hell am I doing in my life? And everything, that, everything I thought I was building towards, you know, a house and the kids and the, you know, the career in television that had been going really well. And I, my identity was wrapped up in that that job. I felt like, who the fuck am I going to be if I'm not that person that's, that's, that's on telly every day? And, you know, I mean, time is violin string playing, you know, playing for me. It's just, yeah, it was, it was a really difficult time though. So I finally thought, you know, I've had this, this one idea. Let's just take one out of all this, these ideas I have, let's take one and just try and do something with it. And so I, but I know, I'll, I'll, I've heard people talking about screenplays recently. I could write a screenplay. <laughs> I could write a screenplay, right? And so I had a look on the BBC Writers' Room and they do, they put like lots of, I don't know if anyone's into writing or does, you know, is into television, but you can go on to the BBC and they have great resources for scripts. You can read, you know, Killing Eve scripts if you want. They're, they're out there. Um, and so I had a look at the format and just thought, I'm going to give it a bash and see what happens. And just as I had gone onto the website to have a look at, the scripts, I saw the BBC Comedy Writers Room was open. I thought, what the hell's that? Found this competition where I think around four to five hundred five thousand people apply every year. And there are a lot of screenwriters do it because it's a you know it's a big competition in the in the industry. Um, and I had a deadline. I had a friggin' deadline to get something done, to turn my idea into something tangible. And I thought, do you know what? I'm just gonna fucking do it. <laughs> I'm just going to do it and see what happens. And I submitted it. And I remember the day I submitted it thinking, oh, you muppet, you absolute moron. They're going to read it. You're going to be blacklisted. They're going to go, what the hell is this shit? Can we just block her email? Can we block her from sending anything else in future? I was honestly, and I felt so bad about it that I actually ended up going to do a course after I'd sent it because I was like, this is really embarrassing what you've just done. So I was pretty amazed that I got a call back to go for an interview with them and eventually got into the BBC Comedy Writers Room. So there were 12 of us that year in the room. And that was really where my career began to take off in, in writing. And I mean, I, I wanted to be a writer my entire life. When I was in school, I remember even the yearbook, it was most likely to be a writer. And there I was doing business management and throwing pints over bosses and bars. And, you know, what had I become? <laughs> So I thought it's it's really time for me to um, you know to make this happen and you know now I'm I'm you know very lucky to be writing you know a couple of episodes of CBBC shows um, you know I've been commissioned by the BBC to do a number of comedy sketches I mean listen it's rosy it's rosy but it it told me that taught me that one really valuable lesson turn stuff into something tangible stop putting stop putting blocks in your own way get out of your way and just do it stop try, stop thinking about what needs to be done and what all the houses that you could visit before you get to the house that you want to be at just go straight for it and it's it's changed me oh hello have I just did I go loud there did I go really loud there <laughs> you'd think I'd know what to do with mics after all this time on telly wouldn't you um but the, there's there's a couple of other things that that occurred to me throughout my journey and my career and one of them was the way that I was interacting with people. I was so caught up in um, what are they going to think of me? And I hope they don't think I'm showing off and I hope they don't think I'm this. I wanted people to like me. Everyone wants to be liked and I don't think there's anything wrong with wanting to be liked. But 
what it was doing was impacting the way in which I was communicating. It was, you know, I had almost created a hierarchy in my head when I when I met people. And actually one of the reasons I never got on with bosses is I don't work particularly well in, in hierarchies. I like linear working. I'm a creative. I'm a creative. I like linear working. Um, I, I want everyone to have input. I think everyone's ideas are, are valuable. And I, I really struggled with um, autocratic bosses. I had real, real issue with it. Um, and so I decided to try and change things up a little bit. And I think comedy definitely has helped. Doing stand-up comedy definitely helps when you see the lightness in situations. And in fact, people who are seen to have a sense of humour are also seen to integrate more easily into groups because they break down barriers. They're seen to be, to add value, real value to organisations. So, you know, clearly 21 bosses just didn't have vision. They just lacked vision as far as I was concerned. Um, but... Um, people you know it, it life is all about people and I look at my career now and you know sometimes people will ask me well how do you how do you do it how do you develop all these different career strands and opportunities and I mean yeah I could take credit and I'll take credit I, you know I, I do work for it but it's people it's just people it's just um being it, I, I love having chats with folk I love connecting with people. I love meeting people in a room and being able to approach them and find out a bit about their life story and what makes their heart sing a little bit, what excites them, what are their passions, what's their background, what have you been up to? Because, you know, ultimately at heart, I'm a storyteller and I like stories. I just want to hear what people have been doing and what's driving them, what's making them tick. Um, years ago, two years ago, just before the pandemic, uh, when, I, so when I had been made redundant, in fact, and, um, and dumped, I, oh my God, I needed to get away. I was like, devastated about my life situation at the time absolutely devastated and I phoned up this holiday cottage in the northeast of, of Scotland and said I'd really like to book um your cottage for for the week it was this like eco lodge on this in, in Fraserburgh and I thought I just need to go and get away I don't know what's going to happen I'll probably drink vodka you know eat Doritos in my pants and cry for two days but <laughs> I'm up for this I just need to do I need to be away and I started speaking to the women on the phone and we for we were on the phone for two hours, and at the end of it, at the end of it, she said to me, "Do you know what? Just come up. I'm not. You're not paying a penny. You're going to come up, and you're going to meet my mum. I'm not there, but you're going to meet my mum. My mum's mum's going to come over, and her mum was in her eighties, um, and she she came to meet me when I arrived at this holiday cottage with a bottle of wine." And eh, she said, Fraser, you know, she's just a very, she was a lovely wee old lady, but she came in and she sat down with me. We were there till two in the morning. <laughs> she had me in her jacuzzi bath. <laughs> um, and it was this lovely connection that I made. And I made it, it was genuine. It wasn't, I didn't want anything from, from her. I mean, I was happy to pay for the, the accommodation. Susan and, I, uh, and Susan and I are now really, really good friends. But two years, just before the pandemic, two years ago, just before the pandemic, she called me and she said, listen, I've got a friend who runs an organisation out in Nepal and we work with marginalised and disabled women in, in Kathmandu. We are launching, they're launching a sustainable tourism tour and they, they're looking for a documentary filmmaker to come out. Um, I just handed in my notice at, at my job and decided to go freelance or to go self-employed. So, you know, she said, I can't pay you but we'd like you to come to Nepal and make a documentary with us for a month. And I was like, fuck yes, <laughs> absolutely. I'd love to, I'd absolutely love to. Um, you know, little did I know that I'd come back and a month later the pandemic would hit and then, you know, but that's another story. Um, it was one of the best opportunities I ever had in my life really to go out there and to to work with them. I was, uh, I met with Jennifer Jones, who's the, the first ever female president of Rotary International globally, um, who's, you know, they, they just become, you know, a great friend and someone who is, is working towards a lot of the same things that I value. I was really upset that my previous companies didn't necessarily see the value in me taking time off to do philanthropic work. And I thought, well, when I go self-employed, I want to give myself that time to go and do things. Um, the documentary was released last year and it's been doing really, really well on the festival circuit at a time when the women actually really needed it because a lot of these women out in Nepal, they come from very patriarchal society where, you know, similar to me, South Asian, so I, I, I get it, that, you know, they, there's not as much opportunity or for, for women out there, especially to be educated. They found themselves... Um, 
sort of uh, not just unemployed, but they found themselves in abusive relationships and they really did struggle to uh, find a way through that, to find um, how to build businesses. When Stephanie met seven of them, seven women, uh, they were working in this tin shed in the back streets of Kathmandu and she decided to pay about $200 is what she had at the time to upskill them to make crafts that at least they could sell. And it went from there. She then decided to launch the organisation. It's now a United Nations supported organisation. 5,000 women across Nepal have been, been affected by it. And, you know, these, a lot of women who were living on the streets, who had been in abusive relationships, who, um, you know, had really struggled to build any sort of life for themselves are now, you know, running organisations. They have their own businesses, their own coffee shops. You know, they've got dreams. They've got hopes. They've got confidence. My God, the confidence in them. When you see some of the footage and some of the pictures of them from when, when they first met to now, it's just extraordinary. You know, that's the stuff that makes my heart sing. But, you know, I could have quite easily been like, oh God, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go all the way out to Nepal and spend however long it is out there and what I'm not, I'm not going to make money from it. You know what? I haven't made a penny from it. And I have made so, so much more because I just did it. I just, I, I've made the best friendships that continue to be abundant. Stuff is just coming and great stuff is coming. Last, you know, a couple of years because of the pandemic, Nepal was really, really badly hit. Um, they rely on the tourism trade. So, you know, they absolutely, Absolutely, absolutely needed to have that funding and it's been great to have an asset like that for them to actually show for what, what they, they do and, and to get support. Um, just fucking do it. Uh, be, be prolific. Uh, one of the things that we do, um, I notice with my friendship group and people I work with is we don't shout enough about what we do. We don't get up and, you know, I don't know whether we're scared that people are going to think we're bragging, we're showing off or what, whatever it is, but we're not doing enough of it. I now, um, I mean, I post everything online and I, I, I post everything across multiple social medias because I actually get about 80% of my work now from just from social media. People get in touch with me on LinkedIn or on Facebook or Instagram. And there's something about building that personal brand. We need to stop being so scared of just putting ourselves out there and actually thinking, I, and I don't know, this helps me to, to think most people are so wrapped up in themselves. No one gives a shit about me. No one, no one really does. You know, there'll always be people out there who want to criticise you for what you've done or who will choose to, to use your worst moment to define you, but it doesn't have to be. You, you're you the one that gets to create that. And, and it comes down to kind of helping you build your own personal brand, deciding what it is that you want to communicate to the world, what do you want to say, and, and just being really, really honest about who you are and what you want. I... I uh, don't know where I would be without social media, if I'm being perfectly honest. I, I don't know how I would have made the connections, some of the connections I have. Even today, it's so nice to meet someone that, that we met on social media and we haven't actually met each other in person. And, um, you know, I was told you came here because you, you saw me posting about it. And it's that's that's how the world works. You know, it's that's how the, our world at the moment works, especially. And so when you achieve something, when you apply for something, when you want to do something, the world is not going to know that you want to do it unless you tell them so you have to tell them what you want and the only way they're going to know that is by you posting something or you saying something we need to really really stop caring about what people think I think and do, just keep doing we just need to do more and more and more um so yeah my I, I I wanted to share my motto with you because when I first started in presenting I would tell myself just fucking get on with it just fucking do it and someone said to me that's a really negative thing to be saying when you first go into a situation don't you want to tell yourself that you're enjoying it and you're good at it and I was like well no, obviously I'm not but I mean I just, you know just get on with it stop worrying and I, it still helps me thinking just stop worrying stop thinking about what you 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 know you're doing and just sometimes you just need to get on and, and do it you know it, it be an independent thinker think for yourself do something different don't don't be scared to disrupt. Don't be scared to get sacked. Oh God, I've been sacked so many times. The book will be out soon though, I'm sure. The book will be out soon. I think it's really important to follow, you know, your ideas and align your work with your values. Um, you know, do, doing the stuff that excites you and that makes your heart sing I, will only lead to really good things. So I think if you've got goals out there, if you are, we're here today to interact with each other and to connect, don't think twice about approaching people. Don't think twice about asking people for help. And everyone post about being here because my God, you're here and you never know what's going to come back. Honestly, I have, can't tell you the number of times I post something saying, oh God, I really miss, I, I, like, week it was, I miss news presenting. It's been a while. I mean, no one, 
in their right mind would have me as a news presenter anymore. I do too much comedy. It just doesn't work. Um, but, but someone got in touch and said, oh, there's a role. I've got in a film, an upcoming film. We're looking for a news presenter. I was like, oh, you would never have known had I not posted it and shared it with the world. So I want you to take this away from it. Just if you want to do something, just do it. Just fucking do it. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Zara. How oh, many okay. people are handing in their notice tomorrow? <laughs> Show of hands? Yeah, oh, well, so there's at least one. <laughs> there's a lot of people here from BizClick. I didn't see any hands go up there, I'm glad to say. Um, okay, do we, have, do, do we have any questions from the floor? Oh, yes, we have a question. I, I, it's not really a question. I, um, um... I just wanted to know more about your uh, charity activities. So I, I, I've seen that you that you split your job in 50-50, yeah. dedicating 50% of your time to uh, philanthropy. And I just would like to learn a little bit more if it's possible. Yeah, I mean, this is the absolute goal for me is to kind of uh, ultimately to have a production company, I think, where we do run um, a global competition for organisations to apply to us to make them a documentary that, that's going to showcase them that they can not just use for fundraising but that we can help to promote what they do we want the world to know about them uh, this year I'm going to Kilimanjaro I'm going to climb Kilimanjaro and make my second documentary film I'm saying I'm going to climb it, bloody hope I get to the top <laughs> it's really hard finding mountains in London <laughs> it's really hard to get training in um, yeah we're, I'm working with children's hospices um, association and we are, uh, I'm filming with a, an incredible group of people who've chosen to take this on this year. In fact, we were supposed to film it last year, but with the pandemic and all the problems, we weren't able to do it. But uh, this year we'll be doing it. And um, yeah, we, we'll be there for 10 days, I think, doing the climb. We've got a bit of filming with them before and I'll be doing some afterwards. But when I'm up in that mountain, it'll just be me. So, I, you know, I'll just be, I'll be there with a the kit. I'm not taking a crew with me. Um, it, just the logistics and some of the, the issues we've had in, in aligning schedules and, and getting initial funding for this, it, w it wouldn't work. So, you know, I'll be attempting to, to do that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go back to the whole uh, multi-hyphen thing. Yes, please. So rather than a career, do you think you now, and lots of people now, have a series of projects rather than a single career path? Um, I mean, the, the studies are showing that, yes, that, that is what's happening. More people are developing. And actually, there's been, you know, the great resignation over the last kind of few months. People are, you know, last year, people are leaving their jobs because well, you should know. they're unhappy. No, yeah. I don't resign. I get sacked, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, no, I've had two resignations, but that's it. Um, it's just been, uh, of course, I think, yeah, people are beginning to understand that there is more, I think there's more to life. Um, but also, they're, they're seeing what's possible and actually having visibility on other people's careers and seeing sort of alternative lifestyles I think is really important to understand what is achievable but then it's the steps that you take to, to actually make it happen um, and, and you know those kind of three points today are what I what I would imagine and what, what have really helped me is to kind of just have those goals and, and go for them but also to communicate with people if you see someone doing something that you want to do it's so much easier if you have them in your network it's so much easier if you connect with them it's even better if they're a friend it's even better if they're your mentor it's even better if you know you eventually end up you know doing having their career and then in turn giving that back and I think that's kind of where I am with it a lot now but yeah I mean people are people are definitely seeing it more it is changing um and and I, I think especially in the creative industry I think lots of people who want to just give it a bash because not I, I, what I realize working as a creative is you know people come to you quite often groups teams of people from from brands and businesses and say can you just take this and give us some really good ideas back and it's like no you, you, we're gonna work to get like you have ideas too don't just give it to me everyone has ideas and I think that maybe that the opportunities for creatives and in the creative industries is is really opening up absolutely any more questions Yes. Just on that, in terms of kind of the creative industries, I find a lot of the time first opportunities, especially if you don't have the experience, people expect you to work for free. Oh um, God! I just would wonder what your kind of advice would be on kind of managing that, or kind of trying to carve out opportunities. It's one of my biggest issues in the TV industry is that it is absolutely not accessible to some people. It just isn't. Um, you know, if you have to care for a parent, if you already, if you come from 
you know, uh, poverty, if whatever you're, it is so much harder because you're expected to come in and work for free. And, you know, I was able to do it because I had support from my family and, you know, I was able to save up a bit of money before I kind of moved in. But yeah, I mean, you're, you're expected to do it. I think it's, um, listen, if you want to do it, do it. People ask me all the time, how can I be a presenter? I'm like, well, there's YouTube. Have you got a phone? You know, go and do it. You can just make things happen. And I think that's also the, you know, I know now from working inside television, if you want to be on camera, people what people are looking at social media. They're they're desperate to find you. They're looking for influencers. They're looking for people who are writers. They're looking for people who are just making stuff. But you have to put it out there. There's no point in just doing it and wanting to email secretly and say to people, listen, I've made this thing. What do you think? No, put it out. Get it out there. Get it out and, and just have a thick skin about the fact that a lot of people will say shit. I mean, honestly, the stuff I get sometimes is just, I think it's really funny, but then that's me. You know, I'm a bit contrary like, that um but you just you, ha you have to be brave and, and, and put things out because i think what what they will do when they see your email if you get in touch with anyone in television they will look you up and if you don't have a presence online they can't really see what you've been doing then you know there's the, of course they're going to say just come you could come and do some work experience if you like but if you're going in with ideas you're going in already active you're going in you know choose competitions are, have been great because even when i enter them i post i've just entered this if you get a shortlisted for something my god capitalize on that and the more kind of shortlists you get, the more um, you're on people's radar anyway, but also people read your emails. And that's all you kind of really want people to do is like open the goddamn email. Just read it. Just read what I have to say. And having a couple of accolades really helps. But you you decide what, what's right for you um, and just keep on looking for those, making those connections. Have people visible visibility on on them as much as the you want vis them to be vis you to be visible to them but you also need to see what they're doing have them in your network and be able to see what what's going on what are they working on at the moment it's just really important to have that okay now zara is going to be coming back and joining us for a panel in about half an hour what's for now thank you zara thank you so thank much you for that session thank you.